Hello, and welcome to the Former Review. Today, we'll be having a very special episode. Now sit back, relax, grab your drinks, and let's talk about these movies. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Formal Review. This is Season 3, Episode 56, and I want to thank you all for tuning in once again. So this is the season finale to the Formal Review Season 3. Because we have reached the end of the award season. So last week, we got the Oscar nominations, and if this is your first time tuning in, I watch all the films that have been nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and then all the acting categories, and then if I have time, I watch the screenplay movies, but that's usually only if there's been one or two that I haven't seen. Luckily, this year, I was able to see all of these. And it's really interesting this year because studios have had more time than ever to put out their best movies. And this is the longest run-up to any Academy Awards ceremony in history. We had 13 months of movies. Obviously, with the coronavirus pandemic, some movies came out later and some movies weren't released. But we still had a good amount of movies this year. So this episode is going to be covering my reactions and predictions for who will win these awards and then afterwards I'm going to be going through the ranking of the season's best films along with my favorite movies of the season. Now, there is a difference between these two things but you're going to have to stay tuned to hear it. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions. Like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with some great sponsors. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. And I can't wait to hear your podcast. So 2020 was a fairly crazy year. Obviously, the pandemic hit the movie business immensely hard. Lots of theaters had to close and some had to close forever. Movies are now really being pushed to streaming and who knows if things will ever be the same after 2021. I honestly hope they will go back to what we had, but honestly, we'll see. With one month to go until the April 25th Oscar ceremony, here are the formal review projections for which contenders will slash should come away with the big prizes. So let's start with the screenplay awards. The nominees for the best original screenplay are Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and Trial of the Chicago 7. So my first reaction is here that Christopher Nolan was snubbed for best original screenplay. While yes, it can be confusing to some, but if you go back and pay attention to the details, this film is absolutely genius. Yes, it's not as easy to see on the first viewing, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Yes, these nominees are easier to understand, but sometimes easy films are not the best ones. And frankly, this film doesn't really need a director to explain it. It's there the more you watch it. And if the details aren't there, it can be so-called a weaker script. But the details are there with this film, so I think a lot of people were confused by this movie overall, but I would go check out Season 3, Episode 42 to see what I mean about that. Arguably as well, I would also say that Rahab Blank was snubbed for 40 year old version and I didn't really do an analysis on it but I will say the script in that is very good. Anyway let's talk about the actual nominees here. Now this is the one award that I do see Sorkin winning for the trial of the Chicago 7. Since 2012 he's had two screenplay nominations and one win. One thing that usually you can always expect from him is fantastic writing. Now does that always mean a great film? Not really but I'm not going to focus on that here. I will say that the other nominated films are well written but the biggest competition for Sorkin is Promising Young Woman. I personally would say that that is a better script, but Sorkin has a lot of great things on his resume and has definite ability to win here. His film is very tightly written and it is very timely and impactful. Promising Young Woman has a message and themes that are beautifully written into the story in perhaps a fairly perfect way, but again, Fennel 
doesn't have the same resume as Sorkin does. So then going into best adapted screenplay. So you have Borat's subsequent movie film, The Father, Nomadland, One Night in Miami, and The White Tiger. So all of these films are good when it comes to their scripts. And frankly, all of them have a chance of winning this. Nomadland, The White Tiger, and One Night in Miami have probably the best chances of winning. But I could see it really going any way with these because frankly, they all are really good scripts. I would say, honestly, the weakest one is probably Borat subsequent movie film. Honestly, I don't really know what they're adapting from. And that's something that I was a little confused about the first film because it's not based on a book or anything of that nature. So let's move on to the acting categories and we'll start off with best supporting female actor. So the nominees here are Yu Jun Un for Minati, Olivia Coleman for The Father, Maria Bakalova for Borat subsequent movie film, Glenn Close for Hillbilly Elegy, and Amanda Seyfried for Mank. Obvious snubs here are Dominique Fishback from Judas and the Black Messiah, Alan Burstyn from Pieces of Woman, and honestly, Jodie Foster in The Mauritanian. But I guess that's just how the cookie crumbles. Seyfried is good, and she makes every frame that she's on screen worth watching, which is more than I can say for Mank as a whole. Jun Yun is also fantastic in her role. While she may be my personal pick for this category, I don't think she'll win. And I think out of the actual nominees, the strongest performance is Glenn Close's performance in Hillbilly Elegy. And no matter what you think of the movie itself, her performance is utterly fantastic. And she absolutely becomes the character. And frankly, that's more than I can say for anyone else in this list. They all have great performances, but Close's is almost untouchable. Now, the nominees for Best Supporting Male Actor are Sasha Baron Cohen for The Trial of Chicago 7, Leslie Odom Jr. for One Night in Miami, Daniel Kaluuya for Judas and the Black Messiah, Paul Razi for Sound of Metal, and Lakeith Stanfield for also Judas and the Black Messiah. So the biggest snubs here are Chadwick Boseman and Deloy Rindo from Defy Bloods, but more so the latter, because... Honestly, Lindo's performance in this is really the best thing about this movie. The direction and everything about The Five Bloods, you can go check out my review on that movie. But honestly, Lindo really was snubbed here. And for me personally, I really liked Bozeman in this film more than I liked him in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. But that's neither here nor there. I mean, Bozeman may not have been as good as some of the other nominees. But because it's not due to him not being nominated in multiple categories. Because Jamie Foxx had the same thing when he was nominated for both Collateral as supporting actor and Ray for starring actor, which he obviously won for. I honestly don't think Cohen here is worth it, and frankly, his role as Borat is more deserving than his performance in Chicago 7. However, for me, the biggest surprise here is Stanford and Kulia are both nominated here, because to me, both of them are starring actors. While both are really good, if you really want to make the argument, Kulia is the supporting and Stanfield is the star, maybe the studio wasn't confident in Stanfield performance that he'd be picked for the starring role so they wanted to nominate him for a supporting role but then why not nominate Kaluuya for the starring role because arguably he could have won that category too it's just a weird decision either way though Kaluuya here is the same as close he really becomes his character and frankly the only other person that really does that is Odom Jr. though Kaluuya is definitely the front runner even though Rossi and Stanfield are great too so moving on to best actor so this this is the category that Chadwick Boseman was nominated for in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, along with Anthony Hopkins from The Father, Riz Ahmed for Sound of Metal, Stephen Yuen for Minari, and Gary Oldman as Mank. So the snub here would simply be Tahir Rahim from The Mauritanian. I think he was completely glossed over. Also, when it comes to Chadwick Boseman, it really would be great to honor him and his legacy this way. What's great is that this is a really great performance, and if he does win it, it won't be just for sympathy reasons. He's pretty eclectic in Ma Rainey and really gives him a chance to win. Though his passing is what would push it over Hopkins and Ahmed to win this reward. Otherwise, I would say that Hopkins would probably win and maybe Ahmed would come through. As much as I loved you in Minari, I don't think he will pull through and get the gold. Oldman is fine in Mank, but he's somewhat becoming a Meryl Streep type actor where they're just always nominated even if they don't have that amazing of a performance. It is good, but it's nowhere near his best and he's done a lot better now moving on to best female actor so here we have Carrie Mulligan for Promising Young Woman Frances 
Francis McDormand for Nomadland, Viola Davis for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Vanessa Kirby for Pieces of Woman, and Andrew Day for The United States versus Billie Holiday. Now, this is arguably the strongest category where, honestly, every single one of them has a good chance of winning. Personally, I would say Day is the best here, even if the movie itself has a lot of problems. But again, I could see any of these women winning, and frankly, I would be happy with any of them winning. But my ranking for this category would be Day, Mulligan, then Kirby, then Davis, then McDormand. And the differences between them are only very, very slight. And frankly, it's just if I had to choose somebody over the other person, I would choose these people in that way. But all of them are utterly fantastic. So moving on to Best Director. The nominees are Chloe Zhao for Nomadland, Lee Isaac Chung for Minari, David Fincher for Mank, Emerald Fennel for Promising Young Woman, and Thomas Vinterberg for another round. Now, this is also a very strong category, but there are some snubs. And I would say that it's Shaka King for Judah and the Black Messiah, Regina King for One Nine Miami, Florian Zeller for The Father, Darius Martyr for Sound of Metal, and Spike Lee, especially for Defy Bloods. And I would also think that no one deserved to be here for Tenet, but again, people have problems understanding that movie. Now, if you haven't guessed it already by listening to all of my reviews or any of my thoughts in this episode, Mank wasn't that great of a movie. Yes, it's Hollywood showing how much they loved themselves because it's a movie about a movie being made. I mean, this goes back to La La Land. It's a love letter to Hollywood and how things are getting made. Yes, it's a biopic in some ways, but it's really just about a movie getting made, which is arguably one of the best movies of all time. But that's really it. And it's well made and everything, but it was so boring that this isn't even Fincher's best movie. But I would say that all four of the other directors have a chance to win here. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if really any of them won, aside from Mank, but my ranking here for the other four are Fennel, then Vinterberg, then Chung, and then Zhao. And again, the differences are very, very minimal here. I think they all did fantastic jobs, and frankly, all of them really excite me for the next films that they're going to make. So the final category here, obviously, is for Best Picture. And the nominees are, and I do talk about all of these movies in prior episodes, so you can go back and check out my full thoughts on them. So the nominees are Nomadland, The Trial of the Chicago 7, Minari, Promising Young Woman, News of the World, Sound of Metal, Judas and the Black Messiah, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Now, there are multiple movies here that I would say were snubbed. I would say One Night in Miami, Defy Bloods, Never Rary, Sometimes Always, Calm with Horses, Emma, Weathering with You, and Devil All the Time. Okay, so that's just my personal opinion of what movies I thought should have been nominated, but I'll save that for later in the episode. But out of the nominees, though, the two strongest are Minari and Promising Young Woman. I would say then that Judas and the Black Messiah and No My Land follow with Sound of Metal and then News of the World and then Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and then The Trial of the Chicago 7. The last one though I don't think should even be considered for this. It was a meh film at best. Yes, it was a social commentary on the current state of things and it just wasn't needed. It wasn't as impactful as it could have been. Thankfully Mank isn't in this one either. Though even with that list I would say that the most likely thing that would happen is that Nomadland is going to pull through and win it all. It is the most artistic film of the year. It looks great, has great acting. It really does have a lot of good things. The only way that you wouldn't be into it is that if you're not into the artistic film genre. But that's the type of thing that the Academy likes to celebrate a lot, is the art of filmmaking, not just the biggest blockbuster. So those are my predictions when it comes to the Academy Awards. But so you get to know me a little bit and also talk about 2020 as a whole when it comes to the what I think are the best films of 2020 and also my favorite films of 2020. But I'll get into the difference in a little bit. So what I mean by separating these two categories basically is that I believe extremely strongly that there can be good movies, but I don't regard them as my favorite. Something could be made extremely well, but not be something I would go back and watch anytime soon. And the reason why I say this is because this is goes back to my idea of film being a piece of art. And I think the easiest comparison is looking at the Mona Lisa. If you go into the Louvre and 
and you look at the Mona Lisa, it looks extremely well done, yes, and it was a staple in that moment of time of art, of being a painting that if you look at it from any direction, it looks back at you. And I can appreciate the fact that, yes, it is an important piece of work, and it, it is done extremely well. The thing, though, you turn around and look at the opposite wall, there is a huge painting there that is much more impressive, and honestly, it is the better piece of art. And out of those two, it is my favorite. It may not be the best painting out there in the world, but I like that one more. So I think that there is a big difference between just liking a movie and again, being a really good movie. Because I can like something that's really crappily done, but because for some reason or another, it speaks to me, I'll say I like that movie more than the other film. And that's honestly how I look at film. And what I'm trying to say is that a film can be good and one person could hate it. But if a film is good and I hate it, I won't ever watch it again. But I will still say that it is an important piece of movie history or it is a good piece of film. I just won't ever watch it again. So let's start off with the top 10 films of 2020. So starting off with number 10, Emma. Now, I talked about this in full back in episode 54, and I go into reasons why I like it and stuff, but I think it's just a really, honestly, a wonderful movie to look at, and it production value is extremely high. Then number nine, The Five Bloods. If you want to go back, I talked about The Five Bloods on episode 13. Now, for those who have been listening, obviously, I've been saying that this movie was snubbed a lot. Frankly, it's definitely made, if not at the same level as some of the other movies that were on the best films of 2020 and not considered. Then number eight is Judas and the Black Messiah, which I talk about on episode 51. Then number seven, One Night in Miami, which I talk about on the episode 46. Then number six, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which I talked about at the beginning on episode nine. Then number five is Nomadland, which I talk about on episode 49. Then number four, Weathering With You, again, which was before the pandemic really hit, but I talked about that all all the way back in episode two then number three a calm with horses which is on episode 54 then number two promising young woman which is on episode 46 and then one minari which is episode 51 now my top 10 favorite movies of 2020 and there is some overlap here but they're definitely in different orders again we'll start at the end here and similarly it is emma at number 10 and then at at number nine, it is Devil All the Time. I love this movie. I thought it had some really great acting in it and really a very interesting discussion of faith and what does that mean. And yes, it's a little depressing and a little bit tragic, but frankly, that's why I liked it. And I won't waste too much of your time here talking about that movie. But if you go back to episode 27, I can listen to all my thoughts on that movie. Then at number eight is Defy Bloods. Then seven is Weathering With You. Then six is Judas and the Black Messiah. Five is Tenant. Yes, I have that on my top 10 films of 2020. It's one of the few films that I saw in theaters. That's one of the reasons, but I've watched that movie now three, four times after her being in theaters and it gets better every time. And frankly, it is an amazing movie. Then number four, One Night in Miami. Love that movie. Number three, Minari. Yeah, I know this is one of those movies that I have as my number one of best movies, but it can be a little bit slow and it makes it hard to rewatch, but I absolutely loved it. But the two movies that I would say are my top two movies, starting with number two, is Calm With Horses. And this movie is honestly just so gritty, but so unique. And it's not, I would say, in the same fashion of like Joker or anything like that, but it's such a small movie, but that's one of the reasons why it's so good and it has really some amazing acting by Cosmo Jarvis and frankly like I said in my review for that he's one of these actors that you really need to look out for and then number one is Promising Young Woman and the reason is yes I understand why people don't really like the ending and sometimes the message that comes around behind it and honestly any reaction to this movie I think is 100% valid because it is a very triggering type of movie and it can bring up some past situations. And frankly, yes, it's a very intense 
intense movie. Now, the reason why I personally like it is because of how much it takes the message that it's trying to put and it puts it into the movie itself. I'm not going to waste your time going into that movie fully here. So you can go back and listen to my full episode on that. But in short, that's the reasons why I think it's one of the best films to come out of 2020. At least it's one of my favorites. So we made it to the end of season three. Thank you again to everyone who listened along the entire way. We covered 65 movies and we also got to do the 100th episode. It's been a long season and I appreciate every single one of you listening. Now, I want to give a preview of what is going to be coming in season four. So the first film that I am going to be talking about is Zack Snyder's Justice League. I know this is technically the third movie of this new season that I have watched, but it's a pretty big movie that deserves a big discussion. So I'll definitely be going into that. And then I'll be talking about Raya and the Last Dragon and Coming to America, the sequel. Going forward, I'm not going to be talking about three movies in each episode. It's going to go back to the original schedule of one movie per episode so look out for those coming soon now what were your favorite movies of last season let me know hit me up on social media former review is on facebook twitter the gram and now youtube where i will be posting many things including trailer reaction handle is all the same it's at the former review feel free to also check out backseatdirectors.com where i work with a big team to put out movie reviews and also editorials again that's backseatdirectors.com please also subscribe to the former review we're on google Podcasts, apple Podcasts. Spotify. We're now on Amazon Music, iHeartRadio. Honestly, pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast, we have our content there. Also, I'm always wanting to grow and improve, so please leave a review and what you want to hear because I really do this for you all. I see the numbers and I really appreciate everyone supporting me and talking to me about movies because frankly, that's what it's all about. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, thank you again. And if you want to help support on a financial basis, please go to anchor.fm forward slash the minus sign formal minus sign review and click support this podcast. And honestly, any donation is appreciated. Thanks again to everyone. Hopefully later this year, we'll be back to somewhat normal and back in theaters. But until then, wash your hands, get vaccinated, wear your mask, and I'll see you at the movies. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Former Review. Cheers. And we'll see you next time.